Well, I'm not a bunch, but some of them from the meeting. Thank you, Sunday, and tomorrow night. Hi. Good to see you guys. How are you tonight? Good. You can uh, you can take a place at the table if you want, or oh, okay. Well, you got the easy chairs. That'll be nice. Nilu, how you doing, babe? <laughs> yeah. Well, you got a smile on your face tonight. That's good. Mara was. Get in here so we can get going. Get the uh, get the door, please. Would anyone like to buy or borrow a language of the heart? Yeah. Is the air conditioning on now? Okay, guys, let's get going. Let's get going. I want to welcome you to our regular Saturday evening Language of the Heart meeting. This is a regular meeting of the Stairway Group. We have three meetings every Saturday. We have a sponsorship workshop at 1.30 and a book meeting at 7.30 and this meeting at 9.15 every Saturday. By the way, if you can't make the workshop on Saturday afternoon, we have two other workshops we're doing. They're all sponsorship workshops. One is on Wednesday night down in Hallandale, and the other on Friday night at the 441 Club. And we just got started with that. I think we've had three meetings with that. So uh, if you are interested in learning the big book and the steps and how, not only for yourself, but how to teach them to others. We'd love to have you at one of our workshops. At 8 o'clock. It goes from 8 to 9.30. What's that one at you? At the 441 Club. 
It's on uh, 441, just north of, Atl- of uh, Atlantic, behind the. Uh, it's behind the Dunkin' Donuts up there. It's the the intersection is 15th Street North uh, South North Northwest 15th Street. By the big point. Hollywood Video. Yeah. Well, that's right. It's right behind Hollywood Video. Right. Okay. All right. And also, um, if you if you like prayer and meditation. Uh, our friend Linda here has, is hosting a uh, prayer meditation meeting at her home on, on Delray Beach, and we, uh, weather permitting, we hold the meeting out on the beach and we meditate to the sound of the surf. And it's a really nice bunch of people, and it's a very spiritual meeting. I think you'll enjoy that. So, that being said. This is a an AA meeting. We it goes about an hour or so. We don't have any rules in this meeting. Uh, you speak when the spirit moves you, and you speak as long as you want. You double dip if you want. It doesn't matter. We're trying to. What we try to do here is we we read what Bill has written, and then we apply it to ourselves or to what what our experience has been, and we try to stay pretty much on the subject, and everybody gains from that. We've had we've had some wonderful meeting experiences with this. So let's start the meeting with a moment of silent meditation, and we'll say the serenity prayer together. Thank you, serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. And Alcoholics Anonymous to the fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other. They may solve their common problem and help others recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. And there are no dues or fees for any membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. And AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse it nor oppose it any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober of other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And the primary purpose of an Alcoholics Anonymous group and a meeting is the teaching and practice of the twelve steps. Which reminds us that this is not problems anonymous that our meetings are centered upon recovery and solutions and God in the big book and spirituality and the steps because that's where recovery is now it's customary and traditional in this group to read a portion of chapter 5 from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous who'd like to do that tonight please go ahead here you can how it works yes sir Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are consciously incapable of being honest with themselves. They are such unfortunate. They are not at fault. They have seen they seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands religious honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those two who suffer from, from a grave emotional and mental disorder, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories are disclosed in a general way of what we used to be like, what happened, and where we are at now. If you have decided you want or we have an ability to go to any lengths to get it, then you are ready to take some steps. At some of these, we well, We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness, earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be earnest and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was we came until we had no absolute that we did it all called cunning, fast, and powerful, without obligating too much for us. But there was one who has all power, that one is God, and we find him now. Half measures available is nothing. 
We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care and complete abandonment. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested in the program of the government. One, we admitted that we're powerless, so we're all called our lives and become unmanageable. Two, make to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. Four, made a searching and earnest moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people when they were to do so <coughs> Ten, continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. But I would stop the entire meditation to improve our conscience. Five, we understood it. Pray only for the knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of what we and tried to carry this message to practice this principle in all our affairs. Many of, many of us claim, put in order, I can't go through with it. Do not be disturbed. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to go along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the all Clear, three pertinent ideas. A. That we were all taught and could not manage our own lives. B. That probably no human power is going to have a belief on alcoholism. C. That God could be willing to be Good, thank you, Ken. Okay. If you, uh, let's open the uh, language of the heart to page 274. This is an article which I uh, pretty much overlooked. It oughtn't to be, but it's really, really important. First of all, a little background. In Bill's story on page 14, he tells about what happened with him. First he says that uh, his friend Abby had told him that it was necessary to have a belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things that these were the essential ingredients. He says, simple but not easy. A price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. And then he said this, and this is the theme, this is the theme of this whole big book. I must turn in all things to the Father of light who presides over us all. Everything depends upon our willingness and to surrender. And our willingness as we go through the rest of our lives to seek God's will for us and power to carry that out. And we must remember what Bill said here because the big book is always consistent, you know, but we're not always consistent ourselves. And many times we will begin, inter, begin to interpose human solutions into our recovery programs without, without remembering that it is God who is the arbiter of all, that in our third step we made a decision to turn our life and our will over to his care. We made a decision that we were going to stop playing God and that we were hereafter in this drama of life going to allow God to be the director, that he would be the principal and we would be the agent and that he would be the father and we would be the child. And so we forget. And many people will importune us to follow these human solutions as, as perhaps they have learned them in, in other uh, circumstances, treatment centers and such. But the big book never varies. 
that tells us, instructs us, and directs us constantly to take these things back to God. For example, remember in the fourth step where we may get jammed up over our sex lives. And it tells us that if we are in doubt, that in our morning meditation we ask God what we should do about each specific matter and that the right answer will come if we want it. So the book is always consistent. I must turn in all things to the Father of Light who presides over us all. Now with with this understanding then, Bill goes on to tell us what happened. These were revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory, followed by such a peace and serenity as I had never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. Now here comes the rule, and this is something we need to keep in mind. And this is repeated three more times in the big book. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. Now it's important for us to remember that the big book is quite clear about this. Because when we go into the back of the book, we find that thing called Appendix 2, which is really bottomed out on the concept that people who read the big book must be totally stupid, blind, or not able to read, because it assumes that everybody who reads the book is confused, thinking that we all have to have an epiphany in order for us to recover. Well, that's simply not true. And that whole Appendix 2 is based on that assumption, which is, is given the lie simply by picking up the book and reading it. And right here from the very beginning, as, as Bill describes this for us, he tells us that, that uh, God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. Well, now that leads us into this article that he wrote in 1962, discussing spiritual experiences. Let's see what he had to say. It is the intention of the grapevine to carry occasional accounts of spiritual experiences. To this interesting project, I would like to say a few introductory words. There is a very natural tendency to set apart those experiences or awakenings which happen to be sudden, spectacular, or vision-producing. Therefore, any recital of such cases always produces mixed reactions. Some will say, I wish I could have an experience like that. Others, feeling that this whole business is too far out on a mystic limb for them, or maybe hallucinatory after all, will say, I just can't buy this business. I can't understand what these people are talking about. As most AAs have heard, I was the recipient in 1934 of a tremendous mystic experience or illumination. It was accompanied by a sense of intense white light, by a sudden gift of faith in the goodness of God, and by a profound conviction of His presence. At first it was very natural for me to feel that this experience staked me out for somebody very special. But I now look back upon this tremendous event, I can only feel very specially grateful. It now seems clear that the only special feature of my experience was its electric suddenness and the overwhelming and immediate conviction that it carried to me. In all other respects, however, I'm sure that my experience was not in the least different from that received by every AA member And here's the proviso, who has strenuously practiced our recovery program. How then do we sit in AA meetings, how often do we sit in AA meetings and hear the speaker declare, well, I haven't yet got the spiritual angle. Prior to this statement, he's described a miracle of transformation which has occurred to him. Not only his release from alcohol, but a complete change in his whole attitude toward life and the living of it, it is apparent to nearly everyone else present that he's received a great gift, and that this gift was all out of proportion to anything that might be expected from simple AA activity, 
such as the admission of alcoholism and the practice of step 12. Bill's talking there about Tallahassee two-steppers. Step one, step 12, step one, step 12. <laughs> so we in the audience smile and say to ourselves, well, that guy is just reeking with the spiritual angle, except he doesn't seem to know it yet. We well know that this questioning individual will tell us six months or a year hence that he has found faith in God. Moreover, he may by then be displaying spiritual qualities and a performance that I myself have never been able to duplicate, my sudden spiritual experience notwithstanding. So nowadays, when A's come to me hoping to find out how one comes by these sudden experiences, I simply tell them that in all probability they have had one just as good, and that theirs is identical except it has been strung out over a longer period of time. Then I go on to say that if their transformation in AA extending over six months had been condensed into six minutes, well, they then might have seen the stars too. You notice that Bill is talking about people with six months sobriety. Because by, you know, I came in in two years after this, and people with six months sobriety had better be sponsoring and have a bunch of sponsees by that time. The rule was you work nine steps in 90 days or less, and you got right busy, you started doing 12 step work right away. Well, that's the way they, that's what they did. Bill often talked about people, AAs of six months who are already 12 step veterans. Doesn't that make us wonder about some of these silly rules that we have now? You stop to think about it, the longest sobriety in the program in the big book was written was a little over three years. And many of the people who helped write the big book didn't have six months yet. Nevertheless, their experience was quite valid, and it went into the book. But then we say, well, you can't even, you can't chair one of our big meetings until you got two years sobriety. And there are others that say, my God, your mind doesn't even clear up for the first five years. Where in the hell did that come from? Because they do one step a year. Oh, yeah, one step a year. Well, that, that's probably accounts for it then, doesn't it, Suzanne? There, there are those who are now saying one step a month. But then, how, I mean, how can you get so damn ridiculous? Don't we read the book? Between the third and the fourth step, there's how much time? At once. Between the fifth and the sixth and seventh steps, how much time? One hour. Read the book. It's all there. In consequence of these observations, I feel to see any great difference between the sudden experiences and the more gradual ones. They're certainly all the same piece. And there is one sure test for them all. By their fruits... You shall know them. And, oh man, is that ever true. Now, this word fruits has a little different meaning back there than it does now. And so we have to be careful that we understand what they're saying, what he's saying here. He's saying that we look to see what people do, not what they say. You want to know if somebody is going to be a good prospect as a sponsor for you? Watch them. See what they do. Talk to people who have already worked with them. See if they walk as they talk or if they're just full of hot air. The most important thing is that a person who's going to be your sponsor needs to be somebody who is demonstrating in all of his or her affairs that she or he is, is working their life in accordance with spiritual principles. The spiritual life is not a theory, it tells us. We must, we must live it. What's the 12 steps say? Practice these principles in all of our affairs. Look to see people who are doing that. There's your prospect right there. This is why I think we should question no one's transformation, whether it be sudden or gradual, nor should we demand any one special type for ourselves, but our own experience suggests that we are apt to receive whatever may be the most useful or our needs, because God, in fact, does give us what we need. Now, it's important in considering this spiritual experience thing to remember that when Bill wrote the big book, 
He used the term spiritual experience to mean the the culmination or the the, the combination of all of our experiences with God and our spiritual growth. And we know that because when Bill wrote the 12 steps originally, he did not use the term spiritual awakening. He used the term spiritual experience, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. The editorial board changed the 12th step to read spiritual awakening. And nowhere is it ever explained in the book, nor defined. That term only applies, only appears one place, and that's in the 12th step itself. <coughs> so what we're really talking about, when he talks about spiritual experiences, as he's trying to explain here, <coughs> is, the, is the combination of all of our spiritual experiences over a period of recovery. Now then, what we're going to discuss tonight is spiritual awakening or spiritual experiences we've had, <coughs> how we came to, to know and to love and to trust God, and however else this article may have struck you. Some of you may have had an epiphany, and we'd love to hear about that if you have. <coughs> Who would like to start off? Roberta. Hi everyone, I'm Roberta. I'm not all It's amazing because before this meeting started, um, or I should say before the other meeting started, I was um, speaking with Jim. And, uh, We were talking about something specific about myself. And all of a sudden something started coming to my mind and I felt something going on and I started writing and writing and writing. And I kept reading it over and reading it over and it was one of those sudden it, it was, I, I ran in here right before this meeting and started and said to him, I, I, had a, I had an epiphany or a spiritual awakening about myself based on the conversation we had had before the meeting. And how I know that is because I know I've had them before. And just the fact, and to me, it, it just absolutely amazed me that I told him that, and that it's just a reading. <coughs> I can't say that I've seen white lights and skies open up and all that kind of fun stuff, except for maybe in my college days when I was on LSD, but. Um, I, I do know for a fact that I have had spiritual awakenings about myself, um, situations, and I choose not to go into them right now. Um, I thank God for them because they have helped me to move on to do what it is that I need to do and to become a better person and has helped get me out of what I'm stuck in. I have had signs after prayer and meditation which I don't believe um, were so at that time were normal signs unless I have had that spirituality within me. It just would have seemed to be something normal or coincidental. I 
I don't I know that I'm not spiritually grown up yet. I don't think I'll ever be spiritually grown up just like I'll ever be recovered. But I know that I am grateful when I get those signs and when I it, it just absolutely amazes me that an hour and a half ago the conversation I was having with Jim and what I, I automatically started writing about and while I was writing what was going on with me and internally and mentally and emotionally and I know it was a spiritual awakening about myself and I know that's only come because of my prayer and my meditation and, um, so I do want to thank you for choosing um, the subject matter to read about because it makes me even more enthused about what just happened to me in the other room. You know, that, that's what we call synchronicity these days with the queer New Agers. <laughs> I happen to have picked that subject long before you told me. So that uh, was in, there was an anticipation of what was going to happen to you, I suppose. Either that or it was just pure coincidence. We'll never know, will we? No, and I don't even question it. Okay, Roberta, thank you very much. That was great to share that with us. Who's next now? And Marilyn. Hi, I'm Marilyn. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, um, I've had a lot of um, spiritual experiences. I believe that God talks to me. Uh, has, God has talked to me through movies, songs, comedians, other people. He's used my own voice to talk to me. I didn't say it. I heard it though because I said it. it was, um, and I've had a lot of experiences and seen God's glory. And yet, I believe that the most useful is for, for me has been when I don't see His glory so great and I just have to do the work to achieve the connection with them because what happens to me is when I see his glory I go wow you're so great and and I'm not and then it's like no responsibility on my part like okay you're great so I can do whatever I want and uh, I know you still love me whereas um, when I do the work of the steps it's my responsibility to connect with with him rather than just <coughs> marvel in his awe. Um, for me, it's best when I don't have a actual spiritual experience but actually have to work it. And um, and do the and do the discipline of the steps, discipline of the inventory, discipline of the prayer and meditation and uh, our tools. Reading the book, reaching out, all that. That's where I find that my better growth has come than just seeing God. Because I've seen God and it just makes me lazy. Because I know He loves me 100%. And it's better when I don't see him than I do the work. And I guess I'm done. <laughs> I'll okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. That's a really interesting concept. The more you know God, the less you want to work. Yeah. Wow, that's really something. <laughs> I've been around here a long time. I never heard that one before. <laughs> it's probably only because nobody wanted to admit it before. But your 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 greatest fault is you're just too damn honest. Ah, I need to go back. Yeah. <laughs> Who's next, Steph? In the back on the wall. I can't okay. see you. Yeah. My name is Linda. I'm an alcoholic. Oh, hi, Linda. <laughs> I'm here visiting uh, from uh, north of Dallas, Texas. Well, we're glad to have you with us. And uh, I am so impressed with the short period of time that I've been here. We drove 22 hours to get here. And 
I didn't know what to expect, but uh, it's different. Uh, I've struggled a long time with my disease. Uh, I've been trying out three years to uh, get clean and sober, and uh, I, I've always felt that I'm a good person, and I became a very sick person to a drug, alcohol. Uh, as far as religion goes, uh, I was raised by a very strict religious mother. And uh, I kind of rebelled against it because I didn't, as a child, I didn't see it. Okay? And then when things, when I got to be in college and things, I went to God only normally in times of trouble. And uh, I never had a real true spiritual feeling. So when I went to rehab the first time, they told me, you know, you, you have to have a higher power. And because of some past experience that I had, I had lost my faith. I really, I couldn't feel him, I couldn't touch him. I just didn't internalize it, okay? So I didn't get it. And I didn't get the program. So I went out immediately. And uh, my family drank. And I drank. And my wind. I always wanted to drink. But then circumstances in my life uh, and chaos that I probably didn't create. And I know I didn't create. Uh, they would tell me and I had a problem. Quit drinking. And they would hound me and they called me names and I was called lush and drunk and all this. Well, that just made me even matter and I just drank even more just in spite of me. When they took all the alcohol away from me, I would just find ways to get more and more and more of it. You know, so I, until I dug myself so deep in the hole, I'm losing or may lose some very precious, precious things to me. But anyway, back to my spirit thing. Uh, I didn't get my spirit really until just recently. Whenever, in these three years, and I've been through behavioral centers and behavioral centers, in each behavioral center, I've gotten a little bit more from each one. Even though after each one, I've always gone out and I've always slipped. So I've lost a lot of faith. My family is practically given up on me. The only one who has not given up on me, who's always behind me, is my mother. For some reason, because she's got Billy Graham praying for me. She's got everybody. She goes to church, you know, and she preaches to me. She, she's got everybody, and she was a little bitty small town. And when I go there, you know, she goes, I'm like, this is my daughter. This is the person that we're praying for every Sunday. And I'm going like, and at first I just didn't get it. And I thought it was kind of silly. But now I read something. Billy Graham, my mother gave me this little pamphlet from Billy Graham. And it, it, it's just a tiny little four or five page pamphlet. And it said that you do not have to clean your house before you come to God. That God forgives you immediately. So here I am in the real world, and the people that I want to love me the most, they can't forgive me because I've created too much chaos in their lives. And now they resent me and they hate me. And I'm begging, you know, I'm, I'm here, you know, I'm going like, please forgive me, take me back, you know, just keep our family together, you know. I don't want to lose my child, I don't want to lose my home, my things, you know. And so I'm worried about these material things, okay? They are important to me. And I'm trying to extend that before I take care of myself. But when I read that little pamphlet, and then it said, God forgives you immediately, I went, oh my God. I cried. I really, really cried. And I read a lot of things, and they say, crying is good, it cleans the soul. I had never felt that. You know, I didn't have another burning bush or anything like that, but I really felt clear. 
some reason, I mean, I've never had that feeling in my entire life. And from that point on, before when I went to AA, I just didn't get it. I didn't work the program. And I didn't give it enough time. I didn't get it for a But from that point on, out in the country, on my mother's farm, I got it. And now I talk to God. And when I internalize that, thank you. And I put God first now. And I told my friend Lori that I have a bunch of stuff out there that's working on me. But first of all, and last night when I was here, I was sitting under the star, went into the water. It's a beautiful place here. I said, I don't care about all this. <coughs> God, is, I'm going to take care of myself first. And I know you're going to take care of everything else for me. So you're going to help me get well. And I am very, very grateful for that. Because now, before when I didn't feel like living or work living, I feel like I am worth saving right now. Because God is forgiving me. And whatever happens, and I get my little girl back, which I hope, she's 13 years old, she will learn to trust me again and love me. And in that situation with my husband, which I am addicted to him because he controls me, and I'm trying to think of my own now, and I'm down here and he, and which is great. This is one of the reasons I'm here and God led me here to this place right now. It's because I can become that strong person again because I now have a spiritual feeling and I believe in God and he has done such good things for me. And when I do things and give up and let God take care of things, they're happening for me. And it just makes me day by day. And I live day by day to day. And I do not have 30 days to suffer. But I've been trying to start three years. And uh, but today, I think it's day 15 or 16, I looked on the calendar. And uh, I'm very, very happy that I will get 30 days while I'm here. Thank you. That's all happening. Thank you very much, Linda. We're very happy to have you here and hope you come back and see us again. There's a lot of help around here, too, if you need it. You know, A lot of people will be happy to help you. And I, I assume that you've got help sitting right there next to you, too. Yes. Isn't that great? You brought me here because... Can I tell? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Because this is my dear friend, Lori, and we've been best friends. And I've loved her and I've hated her many, many times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we've never... We've always take care of each other no matter what's going on in our lives. I've been four sinners. And she went to one in Delray Beach just recently. And when she came back, she called me. And she got it. And I was like, oh, man, you didn't get it, you know? But she did. Because I've been hanging around her. <laughs> and now I'm living with her. And I can't live at home. So anyway, we, we do the meditation thing. And I'm doing the structure thing, which I've never done before. Anyway, she, she says, calls me and she says, will you go to Florida with me? Because she loves it here. She's crying on her way from Florida to Texas because she doesn't want to leave, leave it here. She wants to stay here. So I said, well, yeah, I'll go with you. And she really didn't think I would because normally I don't do things. I don't leave my family. But she brought me here. And this is, y'all are totally... We're from a little town, Sherman, Denison, Texas. <laughs> and our groups, they're good, but I've gotten so much from here. And she got it the first time because she came to these places here. God brought her here, too, I think. But anyway, I'm glad to be here, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. That's wonderful to hear. Who's next? My name's Tom, not the voice. Hey, Tom. Uh, I think one of my first, I had a like, spiritual experience. Coming into the spiritual awakening really slowly. And I talked about it in three months or whatever. But I remember having that feeling when, when uh, I, I, I gave, you know, I lost control of something and I realized it was going to be all right. And I was trying so hard to do something, to keep something from happening or, or to get something to happen. And when I didn't, I lost control, and then I realized it's going to be okay. That was like a spiritual experience. 
I, I, I actually had a spiritual experience before I quit drinking. That uh, I I been working. I think I was a cook or something, and I came home. I had my beer, and I had just built the day before. I had built this drug box. I had, had everything in. You had lights when you opened it up. Whole tape case. I mean, it was really bad. I had everything, and it was gone. And you know, I flipped out. I cranked the music up a lot. I had I had my room right next to mom and dad's room. You know, and I, and I was I was crazy. And then I said, something happened. Whatever, I got real quiet, the stereo was blaring, but I got, you know, everything got real quiet. And it just came in, it just doesn't matter. I didn't care. You know, it's okay. Now we know it's like a spiritual experience. And that was like the first one I can remember. And I've had many, many in sobriety. You know, just like realizations that, wow, I should have done that. I'm getting real slow. I'm still getting it. Well, you're bound to have a spiritual awakening if somebody steals your drug box. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Hey, Mark. Uh, in 1999, I was, uh, you know, my whole life been trying to really pursue God. And uh, I, had, I always wondered why I was here, what I was supposed to do. But I was going through a lot of difficult times from 95 to 99. And uh, I remember I was in my house one night and I was basically yelling at God. I'm like, God, why am I here? What am I supposed to do? And I was I was getting nuts. And um, I had an overwhelming feeling. It was like every cell in my body understood exactly what the answer was. And... Uh, what I interpreted as I was supposed to become a silent preacher is what I called it, which is somebody that walks a walk with that talk and talk, you know, because uh, in my mind, I know if somebody preaches to me, I'm hard-headed and defiant, and I will never listen to them. And uh, if I see somebody that's got it, uh, then I will come to them and, and wonder why, what it is that they have, you know. So I, I knew I was supposed to be somebody that had it um, in my life and that other people would come to me and, and uh, wonder, you know, what it is and they would be open at that time. Um, and the thing is, uh, for years, you know, I, uh, I was like, I'll never be it. I'll never be able to do that, you know. There's no possible way. Not possible because all I could do is talk about God, you know. And uh, the, you know, the thing is, it was really neat because I'd be riding down the road and I saw somebody running, and they were a long way off. I could barely see them, and I'll, and I'd be like, I'd be looking at them like that is a silent creature. And I'd get when they got closer and closer and closer, I drove by. They had a smile on their face. They weren't sweating a drop. They were running fast. They were in great physical shape, happy and serene as could be. And then I would be somewhere else, and somebody else would have it. And God was showing me the people that had it. Um, and so he, that was giving me a better taste of, of what was out there, what He was doing for people. Um, it's just, I mean, it, it's been amazing experiences that I've had. One, another thing is, I used to swim in the ocean and I would pray to God and I would say, God, just tune me up, you know, tell me the truth. I don't, I need to be fed the truth. And I'd be swimming and I'd try to tune in and I'd he'd be feeding into my head all the stuff about the world, about, you know, politics and how crooked everything is. And I'd be like, whoa, 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 slow down. I, I'm still being out with baby. I don't need that much. Um, I mean, the stuff that was coming in my head was overwhelming. It was, I, I, I couldn't believe what all of was predating me, you know, when I asked for it. Um, and a lot of people in the rooms say that, uh, you know, when things happen or, or whatever's happening in their life, they don't need to know why. Well, I, I'm not that kind of person. I need to know why. So when something bad happens in my life, I pray and I go, God, why is this happening? And he has never once not answered me. And, uh, and, it, and it is never a bad thing in my life. It is always a good thing. There's a reason this situation is occurring. And it may be painful, but there's a purpose for it, a positive.
positive purpose in my life. Um, that's most of the stuff that, he, that he's been doing in my life. But uh, I know one thing for sure. Every person that I meet in my life, God, they have a gift for me, and I have a gift for them. So whenever I meet anybody, I try to ask, what is it, what gift is it that they have for me? You know? um, if it's somebody that's behaving terribly, uh, a lot of times I'll go, thank you, God, for showing me what I'm not supposed to be like. You know, so I don't have to be an asshole. You know, um, and that, that's most of the stuff that, you know, most of my God, the spiritual stuff. That's not that good. Hey, thank you, Mark. Thank yes, you. Su- Suzanne? Sober, sober, yeah. Sober. He made me so cold, sober, and he made me so straight. 
just to show me that he's always been sharing me. And all I have to do is ask for help. Did I get the sponsor right away? No. But he's still worth a separate no. But he's always proving over and over and over again. I'm here to ask for my help. You know, but hey, take the sponsor too, you know. But, you know, anyway, that's my Thank you, Suzanne. My name is Tim Alcoholic. Okay. Yeah. This is uh, very interesting for me that, um, you know, you look at, as it was saying in the book, that a man can go up there and speak and say he hasn't got the spiritual angle and stuff and where everyone else can see it. And I kind of keep that area of my life very simple, the fact that my mind is not racing and that I can slow down just for a little bit of time in my day and my mind can be quiet. I've read before that sanity is soundness of mind and the fact that my mind isn't racing my whole life is not revolved around Tim getting his next drink or where am I going to drink and how much am I going to get or how much money I have to that. So that, that's a spiritual awakening for me. I think that uh, it's a process that it continues throughout my sobriety that uh, my awakening will get bigger and bigger. But on the other hand, a spiritual experience I can just have is uh, looking at the stars in the sky or just seeing a bird fly by. I think sometimes as alcoholics and addicts we're very hard on ourselves. We're going to sit here and meditate and we're not going to be close with God unless we see a lightning bolt or a big thing of light or all these things. And it may be quite some time if never that we, we see this huge light or uh, this image or what have you. I think that uh, I need to just be close with God just by quieting my day and quieting my mind. And to keep it short, there was a uh, a quick story I read one time that this uh, Zen master went to go meditate in this old dilapidated house and he was not going to stop meditating until he was enlightened. Here he is, it's this run-down house, he's meditating for months at a time and there's all this gunk pouring on his head and he just sitting there continued to wait, uh, wait for his enlightenment and these two teenagers walked by and the one teenager said, what's with this guy? And the other teenager had said, some say he's a great enlightened Zen master, others just say that he's a shithead. And with uh, the other, with the guy hearing that, he was enlightened and got up. And so instead of him waiting for this big light and this big uh, fire boulder, what have you, he got enlightened off of something simple. For myself, that's what I really have to look at. The fact that I'm sitting there, I can actually quiet my mind at this day and just relax just for even if it's a minute or 30 minutes is a miracle because tonight... Tim wouldn't be sitting here calm with a bunch of alcoholics talking about spirituality. I would be chasing my next drink, getting thrown out of a bar or in handcuffs. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. All right, who's next? My name's John, I'm alcoholic. First, I want to say to this that I believe that we have experience. I suggest that you run to this woman here. But that's your name, Super. I believe you do. I've watched you for a long time. Well, so it's couple of months anyway. And I see how hard you work. Try. Um, I believe you too. And uh, what did I want to say? Okay, I've got to watch what I say. I also got to watch what I listen to. Because uh, I've heard a lot of people with, with stuff I've said. And, uh, the way I said it. Like the other night, I, I'm having a problem with kind of judging some people with, with multiple years of uh, abstinence on home. I heard uh, a guy who had described himself as a wino on the sidewalk drinking out of a brown paper bag at his anniversary uh, called somebody a junkie that didn't belong to me and a week later. I just had a hard time figuring that one out. So, you know, I, I, I went and I prayed for that, and I think he must be better and stuff. And then I heard a woman with multiple years of abstinence from alcohol um, refer to a, another young woman, newcomer, in the program's pregnancy as being knocked up, and I had a hard time with that. But uh, I see her working with the girl after that, so I figured she figured that out on herself. I don't know. So that, that's what I wanted to get out because I've been going through that. Nobody's perfect, and I'm certainly not the one to judge. Um, I want to say something about Billy Graham. Um, I did have the uh, white light lightning there. I'm afraid to talk about this. Some people think it's crazy. But that's going be not different than they ever thought of before. But uh, Billy Graham was on the TV. And I 
and I hated Billy Graham. I persecuted him. I persecuted people with alcoholics and others. I persecuted any kind of spiritual person or religious person. And uh, the thing I, I mentioned about watching what I listen to is you know, there's two different kinds of, of people in alcoholics and others. There's, there's true members of alcoholics and others. And then there's people who come to meetings. And that, a lot of other people come to meetings now. But I need to stick with the people who are true members of Alcoholics Anonymous because those are the ones. Now, if, if we can believe that Bill had an epiphany, well, why can't we believe you had it? You know? And after having one, you know, I used to say people like you like you it. But after having one, now I have to confess. I was out of my mind for not believing them. So, uh, that's all. I really have to come to these things. That's all. Yeah, thanks, John. There's uh, something I wanted to share with you. If you don't mind just hang loose here for a second. Phil writes about his experience. He says, The jaws of the dilemma really crushed. I hit an all-time block. I can only suppose that any particle of belief that there was a single thing I could do for myself alone was for the moment rubbed out. And I found myself as a child, utterly alone in complete darkness. I cried out as a child, expecting little, indeed expecting nothing. I simply said, if there is a God, will he show himself? Then I was granted one of those instantaneous illuminations. The sort of thing that really defies description. I was seized with great joy and ecstasy beyond all possible expression. In the mind's eye it seemed to me I stood on a high mountain. I was taken there. I had not climbed it. And then the great thought burst upon me. Bill, you are a free man. This is the God of the scriptures. And then I was filled with a consciousness of a presence. A great peace fell over me, and I was with this I don't know how long. And then the dark side put in an appearance that said to me, Perhaps, Bill, you are hallucinating. You'd better call in the doctor. So the doctor came, and haltingly I told him of the experience. Then came great words for Alcoholics Anonymous. The little man had listened, looking at me so benignly with those blue eyes of his, and at length he said to me, Bill, you are not crazy. I have read about this sort of thing in the books, but I have never seen it firsthand. I don't know what it is you have, Bill, but it must be some great psychic event, and you better hang on to it. It's so much better than what you had only an hour ago. Couldn't be more clear than that, could it, guys? Anybody have anything like that? You having some sort of a spasm or an irresistible impulse? <laughs> I do. The Dear God letters have helped me tremendously. Not only praying, meditating, working the steps, I do Dear God letters to get my answers. Mm-hmm. And I have had some very strong experiences that have been very helpful. Absolutely. If the answers will come if we want them. That's the rule. Well, if my head's been saying to bake me the stuff for 24 hours, I'm going to hear it. Yeah. I know. Okay, let's close the meeting. Oh, wait a second. Don't move. <laughs> Marilyn will have six little kittens all at one time if we don't pay the rent. <laughs> pay the rent. <laughs> then we'll close the meeting. All right, Timmy boy. She's still having her spiritual experience, guys, so don't... It's all right. Let this circle represent the unity of our fellowship. 
Let's have a moment of silence for those who are still suffering. And then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Please remember in the stairway group, we don't say anything after we say amen. Thank you, Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here. See you next week. God willing, and the crypt don't rise. Thank you. Uh, we're at the meeting. Thank you, Father. They're hugging like they're hugging. Oh, they're not supposed to do that? Shame on Shame. And this one needs to go in flat or not? No. I don't know what I wrote about, but I thought it was a while I was praying for happened when I was talking to somebody in there. Why am I not surprised? Oh, I guess so. It'll cost you 10 bucks. What do you want, I'm 17 here? There you go. <laughs> 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 Unbelievable. Good stuff, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will have you read it. I have a note in my journal today and everything that happened. Really? So now I know what happened.